I will divide today my talk in two parts. Huh? Then I will try to give you a hint of TIRC microscopy. And after I will show you how by using several techniques of microscopy, we answer a question in the lab that I'm running in Milan. Then first, let's focus on this beautiful TIRC microscopy and on the mechanism of cell spreading. Then we use this cell spreading assay that you can see here with uh, the interference DIC. Like. Then this is basically an assay where we drop fibroblasts or whatever cell on a clean glass cover still covered with matrix, fibronectin in that case, and the cells change shape and spread on the cover still. The advantage of this assay, I'm interested in the crosstalk between the membrane, the cytoskeleton, during cell shape changes. And that's a beautiful essay to try to have a robust framework to work on cell shape changes, because you can see the cells are this rough ball, and then suddenly they become this flat egg, and all that happened in like 15 minutes. Then it's a very robust essay to try to understand this stuff. And this is also what happens in your body in many places, and particularly when you have neutrophils that are circulating and then they need to extravasate to the site of inflammation. And uh, different essays like cells that are sentinel in your um, cavity that have this property of migrating and moving in the same way with this like flat egg shape. Then what type of problem and what type of answer did we get from this microscopy that we're going to see along the lecture? that we solve different problems around edge tracking, knowing what's the property of the leading edge of the cell, adhesion formation, cytoskeletal dynamics, and also membrane dynamics. Then what are the principles of the PIRF microscopy? Then this is one of the most like, uh, uh, simple and in a sense a beautiful microscope because this is the optimal system to have a section, a light section. Then what you do is that you have the light, propagating light, and you have an interface between two media in your system. This is the water generally, or the water-based media, and the glass. And each of these media, like the glass or the water, have a refracting index, like a And then this like refracting index is 1.5 for the glass and around 1.3 for the water. Then this difference in refracting index creates an interface where you have the light that is reflected, then you can find that in any kind of transparent, meaning like a plastic and air, water and glass, and it doesn't matter. But for sure, in microscopy, all the microscopes have been optimized to work with this interface, because this is obviously the best to do cell biology. Then what happens when you have that? You have a slight electromagnetic field, basically, like some light is get, still getting through. And around 100 nanometer above your glass, you have this capacity to have some excitation, to be able to excite fluorophore with the laser. Then this is, as I say, very simple to have optical sectioning. And one of the best, because have you seen from confocal principle, epifluorescence, and so on, here, you stimulate your cell on a sheet of light, basically, that is 100 nanometer, that's it. Then the fluorophore above, only in the cytosome, are not stimulated, are not bleached, and the cell doesn't receive like many toxicity. Principle, optically, two systems, one very cheap, which is just basically a prism and you bring a laser under, whatever color you want. Then you can do large region. One, much more expensive, but this is the most easy to use. Then depending where you are, you can have those two systems. Then both have their advantage and their inconvenience outside of the price, is that this is more to screen large region. You can build very customized stuff, but the resolution is a bit lower because here you can go to 100x objective. Well, here, having an immersion water objective that has a large field of view, uh, you will not go for super high numerical aperture. Then, only 100 nanometer, that's the advantage. Good signal to noise ratio, then, because you have far less background, less photo bleaching, and it's also very homogeneous, as you have seen from the other optical sectioning, particularly the confocal. If you look like line scan confocal, you start, and between the start and finish of your image, you have time, because you need to scan. This shine at the same time everything. The restriction, it's the counterpart of the advantage, is that it's just enlightening the 10, the 100 nanometer of your uh, at the interface with the glass. Then how we deal with it for the aspect of understanding cell spreading and the mechanics of the cell. Then as you see here, you can try to develop software algorithm to try to follow. This is a DIC, for example. You try to follow the edge of the cell from the IC or for phase contrast. 
then you obtain some results, but basically you have a large margin of error, about 20%. Then that may be fine in some cases, if you have a large number and you have an obvious changes, for example, you put a drug that kills the, the, the spreading, then okay, you can see the difference and quantify that, but that's not the best, because there is complicated like, aspect in those images where they look nice when you look at them. But for a computer, because the IC, for example, you have two edges, one is bright, one is dark, and at the interface between these two edges, you don't see the edge. Then computer based like uh, cropping and so on are not good to highlight this type of stuff. Then you turn to fluorescence, and that's here, for example, you have a VASP, which is a molecule that binds and regulates actin. And you can see like the difference between the IC and TIRF. Then you have this beautiful, like very high contrast ratio. And you can also decipher what the cell is doing. Then the advantage of that is that because I'm 100 nanometer, I really see where the cell is attaching to the substrate. And I picked this example in particular because you see the difference. Here you have the IC and here the TIFF. Then what you see, for example, in this early phase of the movie, if you crop the cell here, you don't see this edge. But if you look in TIRF, the edge is not attaching to the substrate. It's a bow. It's like my hand is going above the substrate. Then the real attachment zone here is not the crop of the cell, it's the bottom. Then it's very useful if you look at adhesion and so on. Then you can start to have more precise and more um, important message. This is done with the lens through, through the lens system, high resolution, but single cell mostly. This is another example that I pick, and this is a, a paper that we never really use like um, a cytosolic dye here. Then somehow it's a default staining. The goal is to have a high contrast to new resolution. And we use the prism microscope here. Then this is one cell out of many in a 10 like field of view. But still, because we have a prism system, you can have many cells, and then you can see the edge of the cell again. Then this is the bright field equivalent. You see how, uh, how the shitty it is. But here you see how beautiful it is in terms of contrast. Then there you can really easily after do whatever computing because you have a beautiful contrast. Then this is what you do. You do computing, you have motility and so on. Then you can have your parameter. You encode the spreading, and you see you can encode with color. You have this. And then you do that under MATLAB, whatever software, and then you publish many papers with this type of techniques, depending on what people. Then we solve one problem with the TIRF, the edge tracking, and really the interaction with the substrate. And let's move on now to adhesion formation and cytoskeleton dynamics. Then this is very useful, the TIRF again, because you are, if you are interested in adhesion and how cell migrate, because you are really dealing with the interface where the cell is attaching to the substrate. And obviously, if you need to walk, you will attach whatever way, but at the end, you will touch the substrate. Then with these cases, then we determined there was two phases of spending. I was seeing that there is this first like flattening when the cell goes like an egg. And then after, there is more dynamic process at the edge where the cell is moving, protruding, retracting, and so on. Then there are by many papers and different techniques, then they are fast and homogeneous, the cell at the beginning. This is ex extensively due to what we call lamellipodiar protrusion, this zone of protrusive, uh, uh, this protrusive zone at the edge of the cell. This is driven by actin polymerization, and you have no strong adhesion, you have very small adhesion at this stage. Then there's this transition, and then you have this process of slower and heterogeneous lamellar protrusion, actomizing contractility, and focal adhesion formation. And now we went to those conclusions because we had this motility parameter from the previous experiments. And now we draw this conclusion by this type of experiment. And here we combine two colors, for example, GFP VASP and RFP actin. And we made like some kind of software like to analyze the motility of the cell. And then you can see here in TF, then this is a bit, uh, there is two. Uh, I will say here you see the nucleus. If you are very shallow here, you can modify the angle a bit in here. You have no, uh, um, no uh, nucleus normally, but if you go a bit deeper, because the actin generally is a a bit uh, in the cell, then you can have also a bit of nuclear stain. Then you can see here what's going on. Then you see the actin in purple and the adhesion formation in green. Then you have this like transition zone. Then you can 
whatever, like massage your, your movie. Here, what you have basically is the two color like that are line scan over the entire edge. Then you see this transition zone when they start to make adhesion. Here, it's the width of the leading edge. Then you see it was very large, about five micron, and it get down to something like one micron. And then you can do a lot of computing with this technique. Again, why? And that's also what John Luca is looking for when you have a screen and when you need to computerize your data. This is signal to noise ratio. This is the key point, and this is one of the best systems for that, the TF microscope. Can have faster frame rate. Then you start to highlight details that you will not see with other systems because it's not phototoxic. Then this movie is done at seven frames per second. Then this is really the details of the motility here that we are trying to see. Then you can see here, for example, this is protrusive. But it's when you start to look at sub-second movie and with seven frames per second, you can start to see it's not an homogeneous process. It's really like some sort of alternative wave that move forward like that. Then what you identify here is a key point for cell motility is the unity steps, the really what makes the cell moving. And for that, I take the analogy with a person walking. Okay, then you are an experimentalist on the moon, you look at the earth, and you want to study people's motility. Then you track, you make one movie every half an hour, and you track a couple of people with your like, lens and so on, and you say, oh, then they move. It's true, I have trajectory. This guy, he goes there. This woman goes there, blah, blah, blah. You have no clue how it works. You need, eventually, by averaging many, 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 many movies, you're going to see that they have objects in their bottom that have different positions. And you start to maybe speculate on what's going on. Until you do a two-second movie with many friends, and you get what we are doing, the steps, OK? Then it's only when you have very high frame rate that you identify that. And that's the power of this increasing capacity with microscopy, is that you can start to identify the steps, the module, the small elements that are really key. And it's just the fact that they are repeated over and over. I show you back here. Then you see one step, two step, three step, four step. And that's how it moves forward. Then you can make chemograph, and you can see much better how robust they are. You see those steps? Then you can analyze that. And by many last year, we published this paper on this process. And then basically, how oh, we explain this process by experiment that I'm going to show you. Then it's basically you have the membrane here that exerts resistance against the actin cytoskeleton that push the membrane. And at the back, you have adhesion that are holding the system on the substrate. Then the force that the actin is doing, pushing the membrane, the resistance to the membrane tension here create a load on this adhesion. And this, as soon as you have membrane and that actin is polymerizing, you can move forward and that the system is relatively constant. But you can run out of membrane. And what's going on when you run out of membrane? Basically, the tension of the membrane increase. Then the actin start to buckle, meaning the actin start to do this process, start to go up. And then you have the adhesion at the back that was holding, that get maturated, they get stabilized because you are exerting more load on it. And you have a preferential site of a new adhesion at the front that is straighter. And that's how the cell is progressively moving. And the wave, the process that you see here, is the signature of that. Then now we unveil that. Then you use back the TF, and one thing that you can do now, because many microscopes have that capacity, that microscopes now have motorized TF system, meaning that the beam can be switched very rapidly for different angles. And then you can go in TF, but you can also put the laser straight, and you go in epifluorescence, which allows you to see the entire height of the cell. And when you do this experiment, you start to have this type of uh, results. This is the DLC. This is adhesion. This is paxin. It's a marker of adhesion. And here we are tracking actin. But we are not tracking actin with a single image. We are tracking actin with two angles. We have the TIRF, which is in red, and we have the epifluorescence, which is in blue. Then when epifluorescence, we have much more in the middle because the, the cell health, then you have a lot of actin, then it's a lot of fluorescence. But here you can focus on the edge. 
And you can start to identify regions that are above the substrate, which are the regions that are blue here, because they are above the substrate. And what they, when you look in tears, they are not present. But when you look in epifluorescence, they are present. They are existing. Then it's like my two hands. Let's say I have a substrate. It's like one part is here, one part is here. And in TIRF, I see that part. But in epifluorescence, I see that part. And it's missing in TIRF. And then you do a movie. And then you see it's a bit saturated. But they alternate constantly. And then that's how you have the proof that the actin is doing that. It's buckling constantly upward. And that's the proof of the load among other experiments. You can do that with many colors. You can do like uh, shiny, shiny, as my daughter was saying in, uh, in, uh, when I was living in Singapore. Then it's uh, you R23 here, which is a molecule that polymerizes the actin. Then in epifluorescence and in TIRF, and it's said you can do actin, epifluorescence, and TIRF. You combine, this is cofidin, another actin regulator. And then you have this movie when you have all the elements put together that you can analyze, that you can understand. And again, I insist, it's very fast moving compared to what people do in activity. But you have all the elements to understand what's the long-term uh, consequence on the cell motility. Then you can microfabricate also devices. That's what we do in the lab to understand that and combine with your tear microscopy. Then, for example, here we make a pit. This is like a wheel. And the cell will spread in the bottom. The idea was to block the processes of threading by holding the cell. And the cell is basically bumping in some places to the edge of this pit. Or you use here a disc, for example. Then the cell is on a disc. And what you see is that you combine your TIRF and your epifluorescence. And you force the system to do this buckling, to have the proof that the edge is buckling. And when you have, I would stop the move in the middle, for example, like something like here. Then you see that in some regions, there is lifting. Because you are leaving really the tear field. And then on the left side here, you have like those beautiful like uh, dark region. You can see here, for example. And you see this guy here. While on the epifluorescence, it's constant. Then what you have here is the proof that something is going on. And here we force the system to do it on a non-adhesive substrate. That the only feedback that you have is the membrane and the actin. Then you can combine, this is other story. Then, for example, here with micro pattern lines. This was done with a friend of me, Olivier, like, uh, that is now in Bordeaux in France. And then we can combine, and then what we did here is lines. And that was to understand how cell behave above non adhesive substrate versus adhesive substrate. Then you can answer this type of question. You can do also analyze, because you have a high signal to noise ratio again, then we were analyzing the parameter of the edge of the cell. But we can analyze also molecular parameters inside the cell, particularly when they have this sort of speckle-like microscopy behavior. And you can see there's flows. You can see the flow of molecule here. And then you can have PIV, then it's particle analysis, where you track all the flow of that. And then you understand the behavior and so on. And finally, also, because of the micro patterning, you can have a more precise idea of what is a molecule that is important to adhere, what is a molecule that is not important to adhere. And for example, I put those two movies. On the top, you have the cell that is transfected with marker of adhesion, whatever marker, it's not important here. It's the principle that I want you to understand. And here, you have a cell that is also spreading with the same marker, but on a pattern substrate. And you're going to see the major difference is that here, I can identify the marker of adhesions because later on, you see, they start to mature. Then my contrast is a bit higher. Then I know where they are. But this is much more easy. Because here, my contrast is so high that I can identify exactly where it appears because the lines are the only adhesive zones. And then immediately, you improve much better what is adherent, what is not adherent. And then you can have a clear answer on the process. OK? Then this is how we define adhesion and cytoskeletal dynamics. Then there's many more experiments. But this is really the base, tier based experiment that I show you. And combining with the sphere of microfabrication techniques and a little trick like that, you can really have good answers by always focusing on the brightness contrast and on the quality of your model. But this is the only useful approach. Then you can also study membrane dynamics. 
And as Kumar presented you yesterday with this exocytosis potential of VAMP and so on, you can do that and so on the spreading. And how you follow that, then one of the best ways to follow exocytosis is to use the TIRF. Then what are the questions then? Obviously, you have a huge change in shape here. I put back a piece of movie here that you remember. Then what's the contribution of membrane trafficking during this change in shape? Because if you just computerize what's here, you have a volume here and a surface. Then the circle, the sphere, sorry, not the circle, the sphere, is the minimal surface for a maximum volume. And you go to a disk, which is not optimized. A disk is a lot of surface with a small volume compared. Then, in order to have, if you assume, for example, constant volume, then you need a huge increase in surface area, theoretically. Then how we measure that? What's the consequence of that? Then we have membrane tension concept. Then what we observe is, you'll see later from the other part of the talk, we can measure membrane tension by different systems. But we, what we show is that we have a plasma membrane area increase that is controlled by the spread area. And we focus here on the spreading and this exocytosis because if you have a plasma membrane increase, it means that new membrane is accessing to your plasma membrane. And the process to do so is the exocytosis. Indeed, the balance of membrane area is always composed between what gets in and what gets out. Then, if you have folds or circumvolution on the top, they are always part of the external membrane. Then this can stretch and relax but they will not change your overall plasma membrane area. Here, what I'm talking about is the contribution really of what gets in and what gets out. Then, in particular, you can focus on exocytosis. Then, first of all, as I was saying with the calcium dye, the cytosolic dye that goes into the cytosol and gives you a sort of naive way where is your cytosol, we can use also that game by using naive dyes, I would say, like, uh, in the same way, because this dye, for example, FM143, is staining all the layers, without exception. But it has one property, is that it doesn't cross the layer. Then what we trick here, we develop a system where we wanted to have a sort of naive view of if there is stuff going out when the cell is spreading. Then what we did is that we preload the cell with this dye. And one advantage of the cell, we detach in presence of the dye, then we wash the cell. But this, the dye leaves the plasma membrane, then you have a dark plasma membrane now. And whatever comes out, because it has loaded the dye before, will shine. And now you see that, then again, this system was the prism system, lower resolution, but much more statistics. Then you can see this type of event, it's dark, and then progressively you have those bursts of exocytosis that comes out. Then here we have relatively low resolution, but we have an a sort of naive information, stuff are going out, and you can even see that the cover slip is getting brighter, meaning the cells are releasing dyes. And you can analyze, they are very consistent as exocytic even because they dock and diffuse after. Then it means that there is membrane exocytosis during cell spread. But membranes can come from many different storage, many different zones. How you define that? Ben, you use fluorescent type of proteins for each of those compartments, okay? And then uh, over many iteration of experiment, we rule out some, and we put some forward by just doing experiment. I will show you essentially the Golgi here, as he was mentioning yesterday, and that was the sort of way I choose the Golgi. Then again, TIRF extract. TIRF, then we have GFP Golgi, and we're gonna make a movie here at Again, like I think it's six or eight, I forget, frames per second. And during the spread. Then, what's going on? I'll let you appreciate. Then you have the cell here, stretched down. Then now the cell will start to spread. Then you can have an idea. There is a relatively low contrast here at the edge, but the cell is spreading. And you're going to see the first event of blocking and fusion that start to happen a bit later. Pam, one. And then progressively, as the cell spread, you start to see compartment fusing, and you obtain a firework like, like a, a image where you see all this fusion variant as the cell spread, as the cell extract. Then you can quantify that, you can do a lot of stuff again. Then, for example, here we quantify, we have several drugs and so on, and then we show really like Golgi, 
and lysosome were the two main compartments that are exercised during this process of large expansion. And indeed, there are the two compartments that also participate to membrane repair, for example. That's lysosomal compartment has been shown, and as Kumar said yesterday, Golgi also can participate to that. You can also treat the system. Again, here, you can put a drug. Like the advantage of live microscopy is that you put the drug in, the drug out, you can wash, and then you have very robust movies where you say, for example, you talk about calcium, you want to say that calcium induces exocytosis. Okay, let's go for it. Then I put calcium inducer, and poof, I have a wave of calcium, a wave of, sorry, exocytosis induced by my calcium. And you can see also the relationship here between spreading and amount of membrane, because when you release the burst of exocytosis and you start to put calcium, the cell will extend, and the cell is getting larger. Then you increase the membrane area. Okay, then you can identify different compartments. Then in this study, particularly, there was all those compartments going out. But surprisingly, they were not the one contributing to the increase of membrane area. They were contributing probably to change of lipid composition, to bring new molecules like integrins, receptor binding, and so on. But they were not the one really participating to the net increase in membrane area. And in fact, the only marker that at the end was showing something that was potentially increasing membrane area was this marker that we use, like GFP, GFP, uh, sorry, GFP, GPI, or GPI GFP, which is glycosyphosphatidinositol anchor protein, which are markers of those what so called lipid raft. The concept is discussable, but it's basically a, a membrane marker that is entering and exiting the cell with a specific pathway that is not the platinum or the cytosis or the classic pathway. How we did that, and that was the little trick I wanted to share with you, because in order to see that, that was much more tricky. Because the GBI anchor protein are intrinsic protein of the plasma membrane. Then they are very enriched, rich in the plasma membrane. Then when you do a TIRF experiment, this is bad, but it's what it was, there is actin here, you see your complete membrane is fluorescent. Then if you want to see something coming in from the cell and fusing with the membrane, it's almost impossible. Then here we use a little trick that GFP, particularly some sub-molecule, is quenchable by acid. And if you do an acidic like treatment to the cell, you can quench the fluorescence and it's reversible if you go up to 5.5 with this particular GFP, I will not develop which GFP, but it's GFP that is uh, pH sensitive. Now if you go at four, it becomes non-reversible. Then what we did, cells have the capacity to support very well acid. That's why, for example, if you have blood tissue culture, you forget a bit your, uh, your cell. The, the media start to turn yellow. The cells are acid acidifying a lot. You wash, they can recover from that. It's not a big deal. And this is their capacity. While basic, they don't like. But acid, they are supporting. Then you can just do a pulse at pH 4 for about a few seconds, like, and it's enough. And what you have is this type of result. Then you quench the fluorescence. And again, you do your TIRF experiment. And now you can see like some event of fusion. And progressively, you see also that the cell fluorescence is starting to increase back. And that's the proof of exocytosis. Then we have proof of plasma membrane increase that is controlled by spread error, spreading and exocytosis, and then you can really like move forward, and this is this compartment, the GPN corpocycline compartment, that is the main compartment. Then in conclusion for this part, we have in vivo system with the tear, we can track cell motion, because you have axin and funerals, you can try, uh, track, sorry, adhesion, cytoskeleton dynamics, whatever you can think about that will be in the tear. Uh, field. You can track my part of membrane dynamics. Here I show you exocytosis, but it's also used a lot by endocytosis because this is the same process that you use here. It's very nice. And terpene coated pit are undrug manometer of pit and they are perfectly fine in the plane of your study. Then you can do many, many stuff in vivo. Like, and now you can even make cell cell adhesion with that by mimicking, meaning you start to imprint like molecules that are interacting 
uh, implicated in cell cell adhesion, and sort of you create a fake or a mimicking system of cell cell adhesion, and the cell will start to develop cell cell adhesion with, with, with the substrate directly, rather than a cell. But also it's very used in in vitro system, you can do many single molecule essay, and it's also the base of high resolution palm, high palm, and storm. And what I would say is that why? Because TIRF microscopy allow all these techniques, and there is no system that gives you a better signal to noise ratio today. Light sheet is one now, but it's much more expensive, much more complicated. This one you can build it yourself by the prism system, and then that's if you have a microscope, you don't even need a microscope actually, because the prism system that we had could be built with just a few elements. You need a lens, a prism, and a laser. With that, you can build a fantastic microscope that will give you competitive advantage to any place in the world, at least to address some of those questions related to those problems, or whatever you can think about that is solvable. <coughs> then, you have question on this part? And it was mostly technical around the TIF. Then now I will switch. How many time I have? Like we start at 9:10, I think. Yeah. Something like 25 minutes more. Like. Yeah, okay, perfect. Then I will talk about this rapidly. And this is what really we are doing in the lab. I mean, part of the subject that we are. In the lab. Why I should put that is not TIRF anymore, but you're going to see that by many microscopic techniques, we address this question and we show that membrane cytoskeletal mechanical feedback or crosstalk mediated by a molecular archaea, which is myosin one family, one E and one F, it's controlling the phagocytic efficiency. Then here we have a bead that is swallowed by this macrophage that is transfected with an actin marker. Here we have another example. And this is lattice light sheets. That's a new technique like, that appeared like about five years ago. Like in, uh, we went to uh, Geneva Farm in the US to do that. And you have the full vision here. It's a complete 3D vision of the cell. Then we can rotate the cell in many dimensions. And the advantage of this system is that it's like a TIRF in 3D, meaning you do a light sheet, you don't have. You scan your cell very fast. Then you have low phototoxicity, and this allows us to do that because with a, even the best spinning confocal, we are not able to get that. Because the problem is phototoxicity, the macrophages are very sensitive. And here we are dealing with bone marrow the macrophage, which are primary macrophage, and then this is very tricky. Then my lab is interested in what we call with this mechano-oncology signal, but really it's specifying the mechanical signal that are mostly generated at the interface between the membrane and the cytoskeleton, that's my specialty. And the tumor associated biological event, meaning we are looking at the stroma, that's where I mostly work. This is the aspect of the fibroblast that you have seen, because these are the key cells that you have here. The immune function, we are studying macrophage, that is what I will present today. But also we are working on brain cancer progression with the study of glioblastoma invasive properties. And phagocytosis, it's an old process, and it's very like a ubiquitous process. It's your naive immunity, and this is an atrophy that is chasing the bacteria. This is the classic movie that, that was in the 50s. And the neutrophil is like attracted by this little guy for reasons that are linked to cell polarity and magnesium formation and so on that I showed you before. But at one point, it's going to grab and whoop, swallow it. And that's the process of phagocytosis for those uh, elements. Then, as uh, Kumar nicely take my picture uh, to show phagocytosis, <coughs> then this is what we show like in 2013 that the process of phagocytosis requires a segment, and then you need membrane. Then, at first, it's fold to do the first event that are at the surface. Then, you activate exocytosis because you have a transient increase in the membrane tension, a mechanical signal <coughs> that signal to the cell hey, I'm out of membrane. Then now I need to bring more membrane. And then you continue forward, and the cell is swallowing. Then we are looking at the molecular clue around this question. And among the molecular clue, we are thinking, OK, there is one group of myosin, which are not classic. This is myosin 1 family. That could potentially regulate this process. And then myosin 1 are very peculiar because they are interacting with membrane and actin. Then somehow, they were a good candidate. And they are implicated in many processes with membrane and actin. This is an overview. I don't focus on one. 
And there was very few like clarity in this system. Meaning, imagining is poor, it's mostly done with some sort of assumption, with knockdown, and so on, that stuff are perturbed. Then you can say many things because there may be like some chain of events that leads to perturbation. It's not directly the mice in doing the job. Then we use the macrophage because there was one evidence in the 95 that maybe one G was implicated. There was an immunofluorescence, basically. All this little guy here is one immunofluorescence. And, but nothing much. And we turn to, we have eight, am I using uh, one in the human uh, body? But two are very interesting for us. It's the long tail ones, because there are many regulatory elements that link membrane and cytoskeleton. And they are also the ones that are expressed mostly in the macrophage. Then first, we use confocal. Why? Because you have a bead, that is a three-dimensional object, and the confocal is the best system to look at that. Then you fix the cell, you stand, then you have my GFP, yeah, my using one e, acting. This is a single confocal section. And then you do a max intensity projection, and you can start to see the ring that is surrounding the bead. And you see that this myosin is slightly leading in green, the actin is in the back. Then we do live cell microscopy also. Confocal again, spinning disc, and now you have the proof of the recruitment of actin here, myosin here, during the swallowing of beads. Then constantly actin and myosin 1 are recruited. That's how you use a spinning disc confocal, and then you can see that. The advantage of this technique, again, it's relatively, this is minutes here, it's very rapid process. I insist again, some process are repeated over and over, but they are very rapid and intrinsically, and it's good if you can catch those events. Then you can make look at the sequence precisely by taking one of these beads. And what you see is that you have the recruitment of myosin, you have the recruitment of actin, and then when, when you merge them, you can start to see the difference between the two. And there was a slight leading aspect that myosin was start leading a bit the actin, but it was mostly colocalized on the rest with the actin. Then this is sort of the max resolution. The bead is six microns here that you can get with this type of microscopy. Then we show 1F and 1E have perfect colocalization. It's also endogenously the case. Then we have construct. And what we did also is that we address the question here of the binding of the membrane. Because so far, what we have seen that with those techniques is that we look at the actin and we see the colocalization with the actin. And what's the relationship with the membrane? And for that, we turn with membrane probes. And then you can do the same game with confocal. Then you start to look at membrane probes. Then you have different tags for different subset of lipid. Then I won't go into the detail, but basically we show like that the recruitment of myosin 1 was with some of the lipids. But by putting drugs that block the lipids, the myosin was still recruited. Then the contribution of the lipids was at best minor, and that was maybe actually the myosin regulating more the lipids than the lipid regulating the myosin. Then for the actin, we turn to different constructs, and to make a long story short, we basically show that when you don't have actin binding, you have a cytosolic location. This was done in transfection and a raw macrophage. Then to be very close to the physiology, we turn to our favorite model in biology, which is the mice system, where you have knockdown and so on. And we have this beautiful system of bone marrow derived macrophage, which are primary macrophage. And we have a triple uh, strain, I mean four strain actually. We have the wild type mouse, which has mice in one and it. And then you purify the bone marrow derived macrophage and you can start to analyze them. But we have also mice in one E knockout, mouse in one F knockout, and we have the double knockout. Then the advantage of that is that you can start to decorticate the implication of all those myosins by having a very clean background and in a primary system. Another microscopy, then here it's just epifluorescence, then what you do is that you do a bead protection essay. This is a way to know if the cell has engulfed or not beads. Then you give beads to the cell, and you have an antibody that recognizes the beads. You fix the cell, you don't permeabilize the cell, and you put your antibody that recognizes the beads. Then by counting the difference between the bright field and the fluorescence, you know which beads are protected from the antibody, 
meaning that they have been angled by the cell, because you also you have the image of the cell, so you can know this cell has angled two bits, and one bead is in, and two bits, for example, here you have fluorescence, two bits are out. Then here, for example, you have this cell that has three bits, two bids are out on the left, and one bid is completely engulfed because it's not accessible to the antibody. Then by many iterations, what we observe is that removing one myosin or the other myosin didn't do anything to the phagocytosis. It's only when you have the double knockout that you start to really like affect the process. Then you need myosin one, but they are complementary. Indeed, they are very close in sequence. But you need to remove both of them to have an effect, which is complicated sometimes. In that sense, is for you, when you are looking at molecular pathway, don't forget that you may have an incoherent molecule. And many redundancy exists in the cell. Then you are doing your knockout, or your knockdown, and you're like, yeah, maybe I have a phenotype, I don't know. But in fact, there is the homologous, or the friend, that suddenly skyrocket because you killed the other one. And then that's why you don't have effect. Then you have to really be careful of that. And for example, if we have done only with the single map, we have seen nothing, then this is something that is important. How it works, then it's not the signaling that seems to be affected. This is another microscopy DRI sort of technique. This is fax, and we use property of light. And you see that the receptor is still present for this process of phagocytosis. Binding is not much affected, particularly at the time when we see the MOX. The 15 inch is the most affected time for phagocytosis, and the binding is almost the same. And cell were able to make the beginning to present phagocytic cup even with the depletion of myosin. Then what was really the problem? Then we turn to our TIF system here, and we call it frustrated phagocytosis. Then you give a cover slip to the cell rather than a bead. Then you coat the cover slip with the immunoglobulin, and basically the macrophage is looking at the cover slip like, OK, I have a giant bacteria to engulf. Let's go, baby. I'm going to eat you. And the cell is going very fast, and phew, it's trying to engulf. Then you see the similarity with the spreading that I talked before with the fibroblast. But this is a completely different uh, mechanism in terms of molecular pathway, at least on the level of adhesions. After, there is very similarity on the level of polymerization of actin and so on. Then we turn to the system, but with our question, and myosin, everybody knows, actomyosin, that makes forces. Then how we deal with forces? Then we turn to this technique which is also derived, microscopy derived technique, which is called traction force microscopy. And then it's basically you have beads, and you have a substrate that is slightly soft. And then you can measure the displacement of the beads as the cell is pulling on the substrate. And what type of residue you obtain is that the macrophages are going. They start to try to engulf your substrate. And then you can derive a force field from the displacement of the bead. Then we did that with many iterations. And you see there is relatively large discrepancy, but when you have regenerating, we have seen a biphasic behavior, which is pretty clear in this both system. You see the force start to increase a sort of first step, and then after you have a slower <coughs> slope. But there was absolutely no difference between the two myosin, I mean, the double knockout and the uh, single knockout, neither in energy nor in max force. I mean, this is puzzling, because this takes a lot of time. Huh? It's not like easy to do. <laughs> And what to do. Then we develop another techniques derived from previous work. Let's check it out. Let's see if there is exocytosis, if there is at least membrane going out. Yeah, the answer is yes, there is membrane going out. Then you have about 50% of more membrane that goes out over the course of phagocytosis, but no difference. Same for both. Same spreading velocity. The edge of the cell was moving at the same speed. Then what the heck was going on? Then we move forward, again, TIRF. Then we start to look at the molecule itself. Then we transfected myosin 1, and then that's what you get. And the cell is trying to engulf the cover slip, and you see, bam, get back to my previous test to stay in like aggregate structure. Then we look more carefully. What's going on here? Then this is as associated with actin. Then you can see here the perfect colonization between actin and phagoidin. This is also in Z direction, because you use confocal, you can move up. Then you have a patch of myosin 1 here, the interface with the substrate. And you have a crest, a sort of colon of actin on the top of it. 
And also, it's associated with the FC receptor. You can see the perfect correlation between myosin 1E and the FC receptor means that it is really an adhesion. Then you can do this by moving adhesion here, FC receptor, myosin 1. And you see it's not staining all the receptor, but it's staining all along the move. If I fix at a given point, you see only myosin in some at the edge. But if you look at the entire movie, all the receptors that you have here that are on the substrate were at one point associated with myosin 1. Then this was a link between the receptor and the actin polymerization, and that's what we tried to know. Then knowing that, we went back to confocal, but this time we fix, and we push as much as we can the resolution of a confocal in the bead system to say, OK, what's, what's the organization already there? Then what you can do is three-dimensional reconstruction. And what you see is that myosin 1E is really at the edge. And then you have this actin. And there is a set of two zones. There is those patches that are very bright. This is true for myosin 1E or myosin 1F. But and you have those myosin that makes a rim at the extreme edge, the green black rim, and also those patches that are co-localized with actin. Then if you make a scheme of that, it's organized like that. Then you have myosin 1, from the top view, you have those patches, the myosin, and the rim at the edge. The actin is everywhere here and more dense under those patches. If you look at the side view, it's like that. You have the rim, you have the patches, and you have long, like, comet-like structures that are holding these adhesions. How does it work? Then by turning back to the frustrated system, who did the double knockout analysis, and what we have seen is that the belt, under the double knockout of this actin belt where adhesion R was much more strong, much more brighter. Then we turn to another technique to have a clear quantification of what's the size and what's the detail of those clusters. Then we turn to structural elimination microscopy, which is an improvement by two of the resolution almost. And then what you have here is that in the white type case, all the adhesions were very robust and small, all the same size almost, but very small. In the double knockout case, what you have in fact is that you have a sort of aggregated, very dense actin and very dense adhesion. Then you can quantify that. And here you have almost a factor of 10 in size. Then you see first in the white type, they are very narrow distributed. And they are always almost at the same size. In the double knockout, there is a huge distribution of size. And they are almost 10 times bigger in area. Then there was a very strong difference in the way adhesions were made, which could explain maybe because you have very large adhesions, which could explain why we have a delayed phagocytosis and why it was not so well working. And we showed that the actin polymerization was also much more increased Whereas in that case, or in the case of normal phagocytosis, by doing also confocal analysis and 3D reconstruction. Actin polymerization is dependent on R23. In that case, we show it by using first co-localization between R23 and actin here and myosin. And we show also by using a drug that kill R23, CK666, you can revert the phenotype. Then we turn to another technique of microscopy. Because after this, you're supposed to branch the actin. Then the typical actin filaments that are made by R23 have a peculiar look. They are not large bundles. They are branch filaments like that. Very hard to see. You don't see that in optic, classic optical microscopy. Even in super resolution, it's very hard to, to have this type. Then the best is correlative practinium replica electron microscopy. What you do is that first you make your essay, frustrated phagocytosis, you fix your cell, take an image of your cell with whatever marker, here it's the actin. Then you do a replica for electron microscopy. And then you come back with your fluorescence and your replica. Then you highlight the zone that you want to see. Then you see, for example, your belt here with the high fluorescence corresponding to this belt here. And then you start to zoom in, and you start to have the details. And you do that for the white type, you do that for the knockout. What I obtain is this type of result. Then here we have 500 nanometers. OK? It's very, very small. Then you are 
the resolution of an optical microscope is that, 200 nanometer at best. And then, because it's a very nice technique, you can do three-dimensional reconstruction by slightly tilting your sample. You obtain many images, and then you can have a sort of 3D view of your acting cytoscope. And all those guys here are above the adhesion patch. Okay? In the mutant, same scale, that's what you get. All the adhesion are here, and this is a clumps of arbitrary <coughs> driven actin, completely like aggregated. Then this, and the other one, you can start to see, okay, this guy may not be a problem of polymerization per se, but that may be a problem of depolymerization. In fact, what I do here is that I have a problem is that I close, and that I, I act as a glue. Then how you look at that? Then you make movies in the context, and you follow those. And here we did TIRF, and we color encode the movie, and this is what happens when cells are trying to collapse I mean, they are making these adhesions and they are moving their adhesion like that. And what you see, this is the white type on the left and the mutant. And they are very different in behavior. And when you analyze that by color coding, then you project the entire movie. What you have is that here the adhesions are always the same size and they assemble and disassemble very easily. In the mutant, the adhesions are huge and they are like glue on the substrate and they are not able to disassemble. And then you have this type of very nice system. Then we show by FRAP, photo bleaching, we show the turnover of actin, and what we observe is that there was a huge fraction of actin in the double knockout that was not turning over, meaning there was already a strong stabilization of a lot of actin in the context of the double knockout. With the help of Paolo, we even force the system and we track only the dynamic of the size of the adhesion relative to the speed of the leading edge in the double knockout system. And what we observe is this beautiful, like, bell-shaped curve, where basically for the protrusion and the retraction are encoded like, what you have is this belt, and then the biggest adhesion are when the cell is completely glued and stored. You can see here, this is the biggest adhesion because this is the most intense. When you retract, you are able to get down in size by a factor of, I will say, half, almost, but you don't go further. Then here, either you break or you stay. On the protrusion side, you can go much more smaller, which explains that really the actin polymerization was not a problem. It was really the depolymerization and the sort of detachment that was the key. Then we turn to membrane mechanics. That's my other side. Then there's many ways to look at membrane mechanics. Then we put this review here when we put the many ways like, but the two main ways are essentially like atomic force microscope or laser tweezer. And all of them have their advantage and their pitfall. Then one is more cortex oriented, one is more membrane oriented. I will not go into detail, but basically we use those two techniques. And what we observe is that the double knockout cells are much softer when you endance them. And they have not only lower membrane tension, but they are also not able to increase their membrane tension when the cell is undergoing phagocytosis. Then they have a problem of membrane mechanics associated with a problem of myosin motor associated with a problem of actin dynamics. Then what could explain that? Then we went back to TIRF and this time we looked carefully at the membrane around those adhesion. And what we observe, this is an encoding for amount of fluorescence. What you see here is that along those adhesions, you have membrane lifting in the white type case, and you don't have membrane lifting, lifting when you have a double mutant. How it looks, it looks like that. Then you see the membrane is lifting around the adhesion here. It's like getting away from the substrate. <laughs> while in the case of the mutant, it's not doing it. Then we turn to a model. Then now the paper is under review. And then what we have here is a model for phagocytosis, but it can be extended in many motility processes that are affected by myosin 1. In fact, it's in the white type case. Myosin 1 is recruited when the adhesion starts to form, and the membrane is lifted immediately on the side of the adhesion. Then, 
What is an adhesive molecule? It's a transmembrane protein before everything. Then the best way to avoid interaction with the substrate is to pull on the membrane. Because the adhesive molecule being a transmembrane, if I pull, poof, one nanometer away, I cannot grab anymore. My two arms are here. If I want to grab my screen, I mean, I can be right there, but if I move like that, I cannot grab anymore. Then it's very easy by just moving the membrane to restrain the access. Then that's the process we have here. If you kill myosin 1E, -E, which interacts with membrane and cell skeleton and helps to this process by maintaining membrane mechanics, you get a huge patch and you glue and you're not able to detach, basically. And in some way, it's similar to the first story that I showed you. And it means that membrane mechanics is at the center, really, of the adhesion behavior in biology. By simple assumption that by modifying the position of the membrane, you modify the position of the adhesion's molecules. And by this way, you can have many processes that are affected. Then I will thanks the people that have did the work for this story and the funding. Then this is mainly the work of Sarah Parger, and this is a student that I have in co-direction with Mira Krendel, the group of Mira Krendel. This is in Sunny, upstate in um, New York. Then Nicola Riley and Patrick Hawkes in Rochester, like they help us for the traction force microscopy. Maria Shutova and particularly Tatiana Zvitkina are the electron microscopists at UPenn. And are, if you have an actin problem, I encourage you to see them. This is the, they are the best for this actin replica microscopy. I mean, among the best, I would say. My best people, <laughs> <laughs> Paolo Maiori and Kim Sengli at E4, and then Paolo for all his help for discussion. We have joined the meeting together. It's very uh, fruitful. Kim Seng for all the atomic force microscope and mechanical like, uh, aspect. He's an engineer now in, the, in the, the center. And finally, Mosker and uh, Flavel, that they are at uh, 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 Yale University, and this is the people that generated the mouse model, the double knockout uh, system. And the uh, funding, Daniform, uh, Hayerk, uh, Fierk, Jendia uh, Farm, Marie Curie uh, Action, and Boringer. And finally, also, I put this movie here that, if you have a question, where by playing with membrane mechanics, you see we can control this myosin 1E adhesions. And while it was not the focus of this die, but you can see the membrane lifting very well here around the adhesion as we play with membrane mechanics. And I thank you all for your attention. Thank you.